Let's suppose that you have a patient that presents with dizziness and you want to determine whether or not they have BPPV. So the first special test you should perform is the Dix-Hall-Pike maneuver. A positive Dix-Hall-Pike maneuver is defined as the reproduction of vertical nystagmus, whether it's up or down, after the maneuver is done. Now jumping a little bit ahead here, you'll notice that a negative Dix-Hall-Pike maneuver can either be one of two things. Either the maneuver produces no nystagmus at all, or it may reproduce horizontal nystagmus. Now, even though this is still nystagmus, for the dix hall pike maneuver, this is still considered a negative result, and we'll get to what you actually do with that result in a few minutes. But going back to a positive dix hall pike maneuver, it's the reproduction of vertical nystagmus. We covered nystagmus in a lot of detail in the previous video, so if you want that level of detail, go back and watch that video. Its link will be in the description of this video as well. I'm going to hit a few high points for nystagmus. And nystagmus generally is going to have three components. It's going to have a linear component, either vertical or horizontal. It's going to have a torsional or rotational component, and then it's going to have a duration. So the time of its onset to the time it fatigues or ends. And when you perform a Dix Hall Pike maneuver, you need to be thinking about all three of these things, the linear component, the torsional component, and the duration. So we already understand that a positive dix hall pike maneuver is the reproduction of vertical nystagmus. But whether that nystagmus is upbeating or downbeating determines which of the semicircular canals is implicated. That's the first key point here. If the vertical nystagmus is upbeating, then there's likely an issue with the posterior semicircular canal. If the vertical nystagmus is downbeating, then there's likely an issue with the anterior semicircular canal. Between the two of these, Issues with the posterior canal are much more common than with the anterior canal. The way I remember this for the posterior canal is the P in up is for the P in posterior. So in a dix hall pike maneuver, the linear component, that is, whether the vertical nystagmus is upbeating or downbeating, determines which of the semicircular canals is implicated. And then jumping down to number three, the next one we'll cover, the duration, this helps you differentiate the nature of the displaced autoliths in the BPPV. Are they adhered within the semicircular canals or the ampulla, or are they not adhered, the latter of which is less severe? And when those autoliths are not adhered and they're free floating through the canal, that's termed a canal lithiasis. When the autoliths are adhered to the walls of either the ampulla or the canal wall itself, that's termed a cupula lithiasis. And whether or not you have a canal lithiasis or a cupula lithiasis dictates the treatment choice. So let's suppose that a Dix Hall Pike maneuver reproduces vertical upbeating nystagmus, which implicates the posterior canal. Let's also suppose that that upbeating nystagmus lasts less than 60 seconds. Anytime the nystagmus lasts less than 60 seconds, that indicates a canal lithiasis. And so if you have a posterior canal lithiasis, the treatment of choice is going to be the Epley maneuver. Then let's suppose a dix hall pike maneuver reproduces vertical upbeating nystagmus, but then that upbeating nystagmus lasts longer than 60 seconds. Anytime the nystagmus lasts longer than a minute, you have a cupula lithiasis, and the treatment of choice is going to be different than if it were a canal lithiasis where the nystagmus lasts less than 60 seconds. So if you have a posterior cupula lithiasis, the treatment of choice is going to be the Seamont Liberatory Maneuver. And in general, the treatment options for anterior canal BPPV are similar to what we see for posterior canal BPPV. So if a dix hall pike maneuver reproduces vertical downbeating nystagmus, that implicates the anterior semicircular canal. And if that downbeating nystagmus lasts less than 60 seconds, then you have an anterior canal lithiasis, and the treatment of choice is going to be the Epley maneuver. If a Dix Hall Pike maneuver reproduces vertical downbeating nystagmus, and that downbeating nystagmus lasts longer than 60 seconds, then you have an anterior cupula lithiasis and the treatment of choice is going to be the Seamont Liberatory Maneuver. 
Alternatively, you could treat an anterior canalothiasis with what's called the deep head hanging maneuver. So, if a Dix Hall Pike maneuver reproduced vertical downbeating nystagmus that lasted less than 60 seconds, you could either do the Epley maneuver or this deep head hanging maneuver. Here's an example of vertical upbeating nystagmus that would implicate the posterior semicircular canal. Here's an example of vertical downbeating nystagmus that would implicate the anterior semicircular canal. And when we're analyzing the result of the Dix Hall Pike maneuver, we also have to consider the torsional or rotational component of the nystagmus. Remember that when we're analyzing this, we're looking at the superior aspect of the eyeball. We can pick a spot either on the sclera or the iris, and we're determining whether that piece is rotating right or is rotating left. Remember that we are not looking at the inferior part of the eyeball or any other part. It's specifically the superior part of the eyeball. And this torsional component helps us determine the affected side, whether it's a left canal or a right canal in BPPV. Now in this example, we're looking at the right eyeball. This is the left side over here, and this is the right side. And we're gonna look at the superior aspect of the eye and determine which direction it is rotating. And so if you look at this, it's actually rotating in a clockwise direction. And so in this example, this would be left torsion. Now remember, this helps us determine the affected side. So the rule is that when you're doing the Dix Hole Pike maneuver, whatever the direction of the torsion is the direction of the affected side. So because this is left torsion, we know that it's a left canal that is implicated. So hopefully all that makes sense. Now let's suppose you perform the Dix Hall Pike maneuver and the result is negative. Recall that a negative result can either be the reproduction of no nystagmus or the reproduction of horizontal nystagmus. In either case, you're gonna go now to the second special test, which is called the horizontal roll maneuver or horizontal roll test. Now this test is specific for the lateral, also called the horizontal semicircular canal. Let's suppose that the horizontal roll maneuver is positive. Now before we get too deep into horizontal nystagmus, here's some important prerequisite information that you need to understand. Horizontal nystagmus in BPPV is assessed using the horizontal roll test or horizontal roll maneuver. In this test, the patient's going to be in supine, so on their back, and their head is rotated either left or right. If their head is rotated left, their left eye is closer to the ground, and the right eye is closer to the ceiling. Conversely, if their head is rotated right, their right eye is closer to the ground, and their left eye is closer to the ceiling. And if that doesn't make sense to you, get on your bed or on the floor, on your back, and rotate your head left cervical rotation to the left. Your left eye is going to be closer to the ground and your right eye is going to be closer to the ceiling. And you can do the same thing with the right rotation and you should get the opposite result. So horizontal nystagmus comes in one of two types, either geotropic or ageotropic. In geotropic horizontal nystagmus, the fast beat of the nystagmus is toward the ground in both eyes. So to understand this, let's take a look at the movie. So this is the patient's left eye. Again, I know this because the caruncle is over here, so the nose would be even further over here. So this is the patient's left eye. This is the left side of the screen. This is the right side of the screen. Now what you see right here is a clip of what the physician or the physical therapist is actually doing in the test. Currently, the patient has the goggles on, uh, they're in supine on their back, but their head isn't rotated yet. They're looking directly up at the ceiling. Okay, So let's see what happens here. So notice their head was rotated right. Okay, So in right rotation in supine, which eye is closer to the ground? The right eye is closer to the ground. The left eye is closer to the ceiling. 
So when we talk about geotropic nystagmus, geo means earth or ground. So in geotropic nystagmus, the fast beat of the nystagmus is going to be toward the ground. Okay? The right eye is closer to the ground. So which direction are we going to expect the fast beat to be toward? The right side. And it should do that in both eyes. Let's take a look. So you can easily see the fast beat there. Notice it's to the right. And of course, there's that slow beat to return it to the original position. The slow beat would be toward the left. But that fast beat, really good video here, toward the right. And because in this position, the right eye is closer to the ground, this would be geotropic nystagmus. Now in ageotropic nystagmus, everything's reversed. And now the fast speed of the nystagmus is towards the ceiling in both eyes. I apologize for that misspelling. We orient ourselves with the picture here. This is the left eye. Again, the caruncle is right over here. So the nose would be even further over here. So this is the left eye. This is the left side. And this is the right side over here. Now up here is showing what the clinician's actually doing, and I care less about the nature of the test. He's technically going to be doing a Dick's Hall Pike maneuver here, uh, but the whole point is you'll see that the patient's head is rotated to the left. Okay? Now they're in left cervical rotation. So which eye is closer to the ground? The left eye is closer to the ground, and the right eye is closer to the ceiling. Now if this were geotropic nystagmus, uh, we would see beating towards the left, because that's toward the ground, and the left eye is closer to the ground. But in ageotropic nystagmus, we're going to expect the fast beat to be toward the ceiling, which would be toward the right, since the right eye is closer to the ceiling. So let's take a look at this. So there's a little bit of a latency there, a delay in other words, but now you start to see a fast beat towards the right. Okay. And again, there's a little bit of a slow beat that returns that eyeball to its original position. But you can see a pretty clear right fast beat. And because in this position the right side is closer to the ceiling, that's away from the ground, this would be ageotropic nystagmus. Now again, we're only looking in one eye here on the screen, and that's okay, because regardless of whether we're dealing with geotropic or ageotropic nystagmus, both eyes are going to do the exact same thing in VPPV. So if the horizontal roll maneuver reproduces geotropic horizontal nystagmus, the patient has a lateral or horizontal canalithiasis. And in this case, the nystagmus should be expected to last less than 60 seconds, indicating that the otoliths are not adhered, thus the canalithiasis. And when you have geotropic horizontal nystagmus or a lateral canalithiasis. The affected side is the side with worse symptoms. So you have to assess the horizontal roll maneuver on the left, and you have to assess it also on the right. Whichever side reproduces the worst symptoms for the patient is the affected side. So if the patient reports that their dizziness and nausea, etc., are worse with a left horizontal roll maneuver, then the affected side is the left horizontal or lateral canal. And the treatment of choice is going to be the barbecue roll. In contrast, if the horizontal roll maneuver reproduces ageotropic horizontal nystagmus, then the patient likely has a lateral or horizontal cupulolithiasis. And in that case, we would expect the nystagmus to last longer than 60 seconds, indicating the otoliths are adhered to the walls of the canal or the ampulla. In this case, the affected side is the side with less severe symptoms. So again, you would perform the horizontal roll maneuver to the left and to the right. And if the patient reported that the left side was worse, well, then that means that the right side was not as bad or less severe. So the right side in that case would be the affected side. And in that case, the treatment of choice would be the Cassani maneuver. Now, one more key point here is that when we're looking at geotropic and ageotropic nystagmus, determining the affected side is whatever side has worse symptoms or less severe symptoms, respectively. That's very different than the results of the dix hall pike maneuver, where we're actually looking at the direction of the torsional component of the nystagmus, and that direction of the torsion is the direction of the affected side. 
That's very different than the results of the Dix Hall Pike maneuver, where we're actually looking at the direction of the torsion of the nystagmus. So if the rotation is right, then the affected side is the right. If the torsion is left, then the affected side is the left. That's very different than what we saw over here for the horizontal roll maneuver. Now, if the Dix Hall Pike maneuver is negative, and the horizontal roll maneuver is also negative, you can rule down BPPV as the contributor to the patient's dizziness and you would go with a different treatment approach. However, if after that treatment approach, and even another treatment approach, the patient's not reporting any gains or they're not getting any better, you might come back at a later time and reassess with these two special tests again because there's always a rare chance that when you assess these two special tests on them the first time, that they just happen to come up negative for whatever reason. It's not common, but it could be. And so you should reassess if the patient's not getting better with a different treatment approach. Thanks for tuning in. Please like, subscribe, and check out my Instagram for cool science and not science stuff.